Good evening and a very warm welcome to Wigton Book Festival. I'm Polly Puller and first I'd like to thank our sponsors and supporters and in particular the sponsor of this event, Montpellier Chartered Accountants. If you too feel able to support us, we would of course be extremely grateful. Books and fine writing are going to be even more important to keep us sane in these really uncertain times. Now, I'm quite sure everyone here knows Kate Humble. She's without doubt one of the best loved television presenters. Specialising in wildlife and country matters, she's done a huge amount to promote the importance of life in the rural environment, as well as the importance of nurturing a love and respect for the natural world. From the BBC's popular watches to Blue Planet Live, Sea Watch, Wild in Africa, Animal Park and Lambing Live, these are but a small sample of an eternal list. She's an author and entrepreneur, and she and her husband live on a small holding in Wales, surrounded by animals, where they also run Humble by Nature, a rural skills centre. Kate is a former president of the RSPB and an ambassador for the UK walking charity, Living Streets. Her previous books include A Friend for Life and Thinking on My Feet, which was shortlisted for last year's Wainwright Prize. Tonight, we're going to be talking about her latest book, A Year of Living Simply, The Joys of a Life Less Complicated. It's a delightful book, made even more so by her warm conversational style, often humorous and self-deprecating while describing situations we can all relate to. It's a fascinating journey that will help us to reconsider the things that really matter in life and will also help us to find a better balance and therefore that all important contentment. I'm so pleased to welcome the delightful Kate Humble to Wigtown tonight. Hello, Kate. How are you? Oh, goodness, Polly. I'm completely overwhelmed by that. By that introduction. <laughs> so sweet of you. I might just leave now and then we and then we don't, you Done know, it. we don't dispel the magic. <laughs> well, I realised there was so much that I actually left out because it's just there were so many things when I start to look at what you've done. My goodness. It's I don't know how you don't get tired. You can't, you can't always believe Wikipedia at one point. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't sort of obsessively look at my Wikipedia, um, uh, it, you know, sort of entry. But at one point, I had a very funny uh, evening when I was doing a talk at the Royal Geographical Society in London. And the wonderful, wonderful Michael Palin was the uh, president of the RGS at that time. And he was going to do the introduction before I did the talk. And uh, we were sitting in his office at the RGS and he said, um, I just want to run by, I've, I've, I've written an intro introduction I just want to run it by you and he said um uh you know so he went through various things and, and the list of programs I'd done and he said and, and I gather you were a magician's assistant and you used to be sawn in half and I said <laughs> I said, oh, you've been reading Wikipedia. I said, sadly, that's not true. It, it makes me sound much more interesting than I actually am. <laughs> well, actually, I know Wikipedia is dodgy, so it was most of that came from your website, which I thought would be likely to be a little bit more accurate. So I don't think you can get out of that. Although I did see something about you quite enjoying naturism. <laughs> well, it's, it's a funny thing for me because I do, I, I love, for me, um, and, and I know you're of, of a similar mindset, but, you know, I do love being in nature and 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 I love uh there are there are certain places in the world that somehow um clothes seem inappropriate for and um and, and there's something kind of wildly celebratory about really really kind of getting down to the kind of bare skin of things um I don't think of that as naturism I don't really want to do it with anyone else you know and I, <laughs> I don't particularly want anyone to see me and I shouldn't think they'd want to but it's just I don't know what it is it's just there's something about, I suppose it's tapping into a kind of childlike, you know, when you're children, you think nothing of having clothes on and, and you know, just sort of rushing around and jumping in puddles and things. And, and <laughs> maybe I've just never quite grown out of that. No, well, it's fantastic. Now your latest book is just incredible. I really, really enjoyed it. How did you come about? I mean, how did this sort of start? Because Obviously, when I picked it up first, I thought, goodness, that's this last year, the coronavirus misery. And of course, you wrote it before that. I did. I did. And it couldn't be more appropriate. Well, it's it's an odd thing, isn't it? I mean, I uh, oddly did the bulk of the writing, although the 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 kind of the 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 many wonderful people that I met uh, for inspiration. I mean, it was a funny thing, Polly, because um, 
it, it was, and I don't know whether it's something to do with age, possibly it is, um, but I had this kind of creeping realization. It wasn't a light bulb moment. It wasn't a kind of uh, sudden thing of, oh goodness, I've got to kind of change my life completely. It was more this sort of, as I say, kind of creeping sensation that life was a little bit out of kilter. I wasn't miserable. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't feel like I really needed to make a grand gesture or a grand change. But I was just aware that, you know, I have a lovely garden and I was never spending any time in it. Um, you know, I love mucking out I mean I have washed my hands but just before talking to you you know I was sort of mucking out my chickens and putting them to bed um and I love all that and and I found that the things that I really enjoy in life walking being in nature hanging out with my dogs reading books um are things that I kind of didn't have time for or wasn't kind of carving out enough time for and I was also beginning to get more and more conscious of the things that I really wanted to do. I wanted to learn, or I wanted to be less dependent on other people for fixing things, for example. And I feel so helpless when I can't, you know, screw a, 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 a shelf to a wall or something like that. And I just thought it's all time. It's, and I, I'm gonna, I want to just try and rebalance life. And so, as I say, it wasn't a great moment. It was just a sort of realization. And then I suppose the catalyst was at the beginning of last year, 2019, um, I lost my dad and my father-in-law and two, the mothers of, of two great friends who I was very close to their mums as well, all within six weeks of each other. And, um, and, and that's, that is definitely the age, you know, I'm now of the age where that generation is, is dying. And it is a sharp reminder that you have one shot at life. And if you have it within your own power to make it as happy as you can, um, then get on with it. You know, stop waiting for somebody else to make it happy for you, I suppose. I mean, I think that's right. I think we make our own luck as well to a degree, don't we? And um, we are so busy end gaining that we don't enjoy the bit getting there, which I found extraordinary you know you you live in a lovely place and you're trying to finish a job but you should be enjoying that job as you do it I think that's absolutely right and 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 it would it just sort of interested me that you know I've done I've done quite a lot of programs there was a series that I did called Back to the Land which was about people um you know creating rural businesses and I've done you know I've done the same thing um and 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 the, the the kind of it's enormously hard work it's enormously nerve-wracking but all those people that I met doing that series had done it because it was something they really wanted to do it wasn't about making money it was it, it was about happiness it was about what made them feel content what made them want to get up in the morning and it didn't mean that they were sort of skating through life in this kind of haze of unrealistic joy um, but it did mean that they felt somehow a bit more in control of their own destinies. And I think that's something that a lot of us feel we don't have. And, and that might be the kind of underlying root of, 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 you know, things, just sort of gentle anxieties and stresses or an inability to seize the moment. Yes, I think that you're very clear about that book, in the book about how important it is to seize the moment. I mean, you do a wonderful description of cleaning out a cupboard under the kitchen sink, and you had me in hysterics when I was reading that. And you know, I then went downstairs and had a look under our sink, and I thought, oh, gee, it's <laughs> exactly as you described it. And I ended up with this great heap of stuff all over the floor. So just tell tell us a little bit about the kitchen, under the kitchen sink. Well, it was, was funny. <laughs> it was... Um, it's one of those things. I think uh, there's there's something about times of year, aren't there? And I and 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 when you look on social media, particularly at this time of year, when sort of autumn's closing in, and people start sort of getting a bit nesty. And one of the things that I find myself doing, um, uh, and it, it tends to be in that gap between Christmas and New Year. So you've done Christmas. And we usually have friends over and they usually have dogs. And so we've had a house full of kind of, you know, dogs and there's dog hair and paw prints on absolutely everything. And, um, and in that sort of hiatus time, I have this kind of need to, I don't know, to sort of do a clear out. And, um, and it's always, it, you know, and I get seized by this enormous enthusiasm. So 
Um, so, the, you know, and, and this was the, the, the Christmas of 2018, 2019, when I was sort of in the process of thinking about this book and, and, uh, and I thought, right, I'm going to tackle the cupboards. And, you know, we had endless, and it wasn't just the under the sink, it was all the cupboards. Um, and therein lay my enormous mistake, because um, as you said, just clearing out your cupboard under the sink, you end up with piles of stuff. You're like, where, how did I get it? It's not a very big space and there's all those pipes and things underneath as well. And yet somehow I've got all these things, you know, old rubber gloves that are stuck in the corner and all that. And it feels fantastic when you've got it all out and it's all there and you've cleared everything away and you've sorted out what can be recycled and what needs to be thrown away. And, and then you think, oh, wow, that's great. And then you're left with this just pile of stuff that has got to go back in the cupboard and somehow that's the most <laughs> dispiriting thing it's kind of akin to when you pack a car to go on holiday it's really fun it's when you come back from holiday and you've got to unpack the car that really isn't fun and it's the same as putting things back in a cupboard that you've cleared out it's just like oh and you completely oh, I don't know, <laughs> For myself standing in the kitchen going why did I do this and everyone is appearing thinking they want breakfast because of course I tackled this at six o'clock in the morning thinking I'll do it before everybody's up and yeah. uh, massive mistake massive mistake so to anybody listening to this don't don't think you've got to clear out your cupboards all in one fell swoop at six o'clock in the morning when you've got a house full of people who are all going to sort of start appearing two hours later expecting breakfast. <laughs> That's always when it does happen. <laughs> now, I really enjoyed um, the chapter particularly about mending things. You made so many fantastic points about mending things and you met amazing people, the mending the cafes. Yes. That? Well I, I it was um, again it was something that that I was conscious of that you know when I was when I was a child and growing up, uh, and obviously no one had thought of the internet back in those dim distant years of the middle ages. Um, and so if something broke, uh, you had a jolly good go at fixing it or your dad had a good go at fixing it or, you know, yeah, and there was always sort of pots of, of, of glue around the house that had sort of set and you could never get the lid off, you know, but you, you always tried to, if you broke a cup, you'd stick the, the handle back on. It never worked terribly well, but you'd always give it a go. And um, and and something has happened uh, in society. And I suspect it's it's the curse of convenience, actually, um, that we and, and, and the Internet is definitely it contributes to this, that when something breaks, instead of fixing it, um, we've lost the ability to repair anymore. People don't repair anymore. There used to be, you know, cobblers in every town. When I grew up, there was a little cobbler, you could go and take your shoes to be fixed. No one fixes shoes anymore. They just throw them out and get a new pair. Um, similarly, if uh, a kettle breaks, it's so cheap and easy to replace a kettle, whereas to find someone to fix one and then pay them fairly for doing it um, is more or less impossible. And that's, that's sort of been a creeping thing that's happened, I think, over my lifetime. And I was on a, a, a work trip. I was on a flight to um, Borneo a couple of years ago and I was reading the local paper on the plane, which makes me sound like I can, um, uh, you know, I'm fluent in Malaysian, but I'm, I'm not. It was an English language paper. And it was talking about this new cafe that had opened in Kuala Lumpur where you could go and get coffee and cake, but you could also take, you know, your kettle that had broken or a pair of jeans that had ripped and go and learn how to fix them. I thought, what a brilliant idea, absolutely brilliant idea. And it sort of stuck with me. And uh, and I sort of came back and I sort of did a bit of research and discovered repair cafes and discovered that they had, well, they were the brainchild of this remarkable Dutch woman called Martina Posma, um, who, her, she was an environmental journalist. And the thing that absolutely drove her crazy was how wasteful we are as a species and we would just throw things away and you know everything ends up in landfill and so to kind of make a point she did um she described it really as like a theatrical event in Amsterdam uh where she said to her friend's husband who was the only person she knew who knew how to fix things could we sort of do a kind of like a it's almost like a fixing theatre show where people bring their stuff and you and anyone else you know who can fix things sort of fix things and we and but we make it a sort of social event and a bit of a yeah well a bit of a a, a bit of a, a spectacle in a way and um so they did it and it was such a success that everybody at the end of the event said well so when's the next one because we've all got things we'd like to fix you know at home and she said well I, 
there isn't a next one. It was just to kind of to prove a point, really. And they went, well, don't be ridiculous. You've proved the point. And now we all know we need this. So let's do it. And so she thought, OK, and she contacted her local community centre and they said, yeah, fine, you, you know, come in every couple of weeks and and do this repair cafe idea. And um, very, very quickly, the idea snowballed. And there are now 2000 of these worldwide. Um, and it just goes to show this is the thing I think that, you know, we despair about the human race and, and about our impact on our home. And that's what, you know, not looking after our planet is, is, is it's like, you know, knocking a hole in our own roofs or not closing the windows in a storm. <laughs> And, and yet there are pockets of people doing wonderful, constructive and achievable things. And that's really what I wanted this book to celebrate. All the people that I went to see were in their small way, um, and as I say, very attainable way, doing something that if we all joined forces and did it more, would actually make a really big difference, I think. Yeah, and you met some really superb people, didn't you? Mm. I loved when you went to meet David Wilson and the bread making. Well, you okay. went to talk to him about wheat, but that I found intriguing because I had just no idea just how bad the situation with wheat is. You know, and David, David is he, he's a f absolutely fascinating man. I've known him for for a long time. Um, uh, you know, he's a, a farmer who has, for the last, I would say. 35, 40 years, really pioneered a way of farming that um, is as kind to the environment as it is to the livestock that he rears and, um, uh, and, and is as successful at rearing crops. And he's done all sorts of things like, uh, you know, looking at, at really good land use, mixing up, growing orchard trees with crops in one field. Um, so everything is about habitat for wildlife, but also making land uh, a productive, but healthy. And uh, he's just, he's just one, of, he's, he's like my guru, really. I, I love going and sitting in his kitchen. And, um, and he- I of that. I really enjoyed that description, but I also loved how you then went and you were trying to make all this different bread and you're very, um, very self-denigrating about your bread making I love the idea of it looking like a cow pat but I mean, mine looks like nuclear fallout you know it's just like a brick but I mean you now have mastered the art of bread making have you um no if I'm absolutely <laughs> honest I haven't um I think I think it takes I think it takes years I think it's like all those things you can follow a recipe and sometimes I'm at the point where I can follow a recipe and I think about Jennifer Burgos who was the woman I went to who 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 actually taught me how to make a proper loaf um and I think about her saying you know don't let them the 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 dough master you and and I think about the rhythm that she talked about the kind of rocking rhythm while you're working the dough um and sometimes I make a good loaf and sometimes I don't and uh and I think as I say it takes years she had this it was it was it was sort of almost it was almost a kind of ma magician's touch she could just look at the dough and go it's you know it just needs five more minutes or it just needs she had this inherent understanding of of how that mixture worked and that just takes time but it did break the kind of I cannot make bread Thing that I had in my head you know it's just it's impossible for me I only make cow pats or bricks um, and now and now sometimes I can make something that's edible which is which is definitely a step in the right direction. <laughs> I mean throughout the the book you you make it very clear that you're really better with a wheelbarrow and a fork mucking out than you are with an oven and and ingredients but though I love the fact that you were talking a lot about fresh ingredients and doing very little to good food. Now, I really related to that. If, if something is beautifully fresh and well grown, we don't need to do much to it. And you made that very strong point. Well, I think, I mean, I, I, uh, the other thing that, that uh, the book kind of charts, I suppose, is my um, not altogether successful um, attempt at making my vegetable patch a bit more productive. Although I have to say this year, second year, it was much better. Um, but the year that I was writing the book and kind of, you know, keeping a diary of, of, of what I was doing, um, it wasn't a great, a great success. Um, but 
it's and it's hard work growing vegetables i mean it really is hard work it's um but it is fantastically rewarding and when i think when you combine the the knowledge of of you know how hard it is to get right particularly if you're just starting out you know growing i had an allotment when i lived in london and everything seemed to grow there but i think it was a it was a much more benign climate whereas here you know i'm 300 meters up a welsh hill um and uh, yeah it's not always quite so benign um so i think the knowledge of 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 you know when you when you when you pull up a carrot and it is a carrot and it's sort of carrot shaped and carrot colored and you just sort of wipe it on your jeans and take a bite and it is so delicious. You think, well, I, I really don't want to muck that up. You know, I mean, it, it's, it, took, it was such hard work to get it. Um, and, and you're right. I think, you know, if you do have lovely ingredients and even if you don't grow your own, going to a local farm shop or a local market garden, you know, thinking about the people who've really poured their hearts and souls into producing the food that we eat and really appreciating it. You then don't need to cover it with sauces or, uh, you know, over overcomplicated never understood the sort of smear and foam thing that fancy restaurants <laughs> I like that description it was oh. very funny it made me laugh <laughs> you think this situation we find ourselves in now is going to mean that we are going to support and use more local things which you've advocated in all your programs you're always saying that and it is to me the way forward but do you think we will or do you think we'll revert again um I think a lot of it will depend on where we live and mm. a lot of it will depend on uh what we did in the past. What's been really noticeable about the community that I live in, we, and, and, I, and actually, funnily enough, I hadn't really thought about this until we went into lockdown, but we, I live in the Y Valley, and so there are villages in the lower Y Valley, and there are villages all the way along with, you know, the, the sort of, the town of Chepstow at one end and the town of Monmouth at the other, both of which have supermarkets. But actually almost all the villages along the length of the valley have a little shop which as we know is really really unusual um, and it hadn't struck me until lockdown and I realized gosh you know Redbrook's got a shop, Landogo's got a shop, Brockwear's got a shop, you know we've got the farm, we've got two farm shops outside Chepstow, we've got a lot of these little local shops and what was incredibly noticeable um, and, and wonderful during lockdown was how they reacted and understood their community. And they started doing deliveries to the people who were most vulnerable, who couldn't get out. Uh, they just worked out ways where it actually made more sense and was more comfortable for people and a much nicer experience for people to shop in those little shops than it was to go to the supermarket. And that seems to have continued. You know, there's the, one of the farm shops outside Chepstow where we sell our eggs and they're, they're absolutely booming. Um, and, and I think people, you know, I, I was talking to Colleen who runs it and I, I said, why do you think it is? And she said, I think people did really appreciate that we really thought about what people needed and tried to respond. And small shops can do that in a way that supermarkets can't. You know, small shops can go to little producers. Small shops can look at their, you know, at their, their regular customers and go, well, actually, everyone wants flour. We'll just buy in more flour. Whereas a supermarket, I think, I mean, I don't know how ordering in the supermarket works, but, you know, I think that it, they, they go, it's all much bigger scale and, and therefore less easy to react. Um, and certainly around us, it seems that people um, still want to shop. Uh, in those small local shops and support them by way of saying thank you for for looking after everybody during lockdown. Yeah I think it's it's much the same in Aberfeldy we had a very similar thing and we also had some of the hotel and um, we're all joining together and providing people over 70 with free meals every day and yeah. that went on and I mean it's just been really very heartening to see. Now something I really want to ask you about and something that I found the most poignant part of your book was when you talked about loneliness and you discovered such a lot about loneliness and about ways that people can um, get over that. We have a loneliness epidemic now don't we in the country? It's very it, worrying. It seems we do and I think mm -hmm. you know again the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment um, has exacerbated that and I don't want to get political but um, I can't help it at this point because I just think, you know, people's mental health and people's loneliness is almost more important 
than anything else. That's yeah, more permanent, me. you know, and this is a, it's a difficult disease. And of course it, you know, it affects people differently, but mental health is something that is, it, you know, affects a life forever. And if uh, we can't support those people in our community who most need it, then, well, I just think we've got our priorities wrong in that case. Um, but what I discovered doing the book was how many really wonderful um, organizations and, um, and kind of ideas are out there to help support people who are vulnerable of loneliness. And one are the men's sheds. Oh, I love that. And I, you know, I'd, I'd never heard of men's sheds before. And, um, and it was this wonderful woman, Janet, who I work with sometimes who sort of told me about them. And I, I, I looked into them and I went to visit one in street in Somerset, a um, couple of hours from where I live. And, um, and it was, I think that just this camaraderie and for those, for those of you who don't know about men's sheds, it's a very, very simple idea. It actually started in Australia and it was in response to men and, and, and I apologize if this is a sweep, it is a sweeping statement, um, but it does seem to generally be true that men, when they retire, find that they actually are a bit lost. You know, women tend to be more of a part of a community I think it's just in our DNA we you know we 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 make an effort we tend to be the ones who organize the sort of social things in life if we've got children we're the ones who've kind of done the school run and you know we we tend to be much more part and parcel of a community whereas men tend to go to work do their work come back and if their wives tell them they've got to go out then they go out <laughs> otherwise they sit and watch cricket if you're my husband um so so there there was this real it, it, sort of epidemic of loneliness amongst retired men in particular who found themselves without the structure of work anymore, um, without a sense of purpose um, and, and becoming really down and losing a great deal of confidence and really feeling quite lost. And so the Men's Shed was started as say in Australia in response to this and what was important was that it wasn't a pub. It wasn't about drinking. It wasn't about getting together and drinking. It was about getting together and doing something more constructive and talking, just talking, just hanging out and sharing how annoying your wife's being at home or whatever it is, but just, you know, getting things off your chest that we girls are quite good at, but blokes are not so good at. And um, so this, and then the, the movement started in the UK and some of them were started by um, charities like Age Concern or Mind. But many of them have just been started grassroots. Interestingly, I discovered it's usually wives that sort of start them. <laughs> okay. so the husbands, Why don't you start a men's shed? Um, and they had this, quick. Exactly. Um, and, and this particular one was, was just this fantastic group of men. And there was a man I met there called John who was in his, in his mid 80s and he'd lost his wife, Carolina, six years before. And he couldn't even say his name without just weeping absolutely weeping and everybody around him you know all these men of all different ages there's some in their 60s and and he was the oldest as 84 84 or 85 and you know they were they were all sort of gently kind of teasing him but in the kindest way and and he said well I'm a bit useless you know I come here there's nothing I can do you know Graham he he builds furniture and you know somebody else makes cakes and I just sit here and they say yeah but you're funny John you're funny you tell great stories <laughs> and, and he had been prescribed antidepressants after his wife died uh, by a doctor and he just didn't want to take them he didn't want to go down that route and he went to see another doctor who said you're lonely that's the thing, you are lonely. I know you're, he'd been an ex-copper, his community loved him, but that's not the same. He needed somewhere to go and talk and just be with other people uh, who weren't gonna judge and who were just, you know, they, they were just gonna hang out together. And, um, and he said, he said, you know, this old lot here, he said, they've saved my life, Kate. They've absolutely saved my life. And it was just, as I say, it was such a simple thing. 
just a place that people could meet and have tea and, you know, a wife would make a Victoria sponge. And, uh, and then, you know, what was also lovely was then the community in this particular case, Graham was an amazing, he'd been a cabinet maker as, uh, when, he was, when he was working. And the local primary school said, we need benches for our kids. And could you make them? And Graham said, yes. And so he said, well, I'll make them, but I'm going to teach some of the lads, <laughs> all in their 70s, um, to help make them too. And, and so, you know, people were learning, they were discovering new skills, they were doing something really tangibly useful for the community that they could then walk past, you know, the local park and say, we made those benches there. It was just, it was just a lovely way of, of for these, for these gentlemen to feel part of something, to feel rooted in their community not like a little piece of flotsam and jetsam that that didn't quite know where they fitted because they'd stopped working no i thought it was a very very moving chapter it was one of the ones i enjoyed most and i loved the idea of these men i think it's it's a charming thing and i think it's really proved just the worth of community and how important it is that that doesn't break down absolutely I love the way you also have these simple pleasures dotted through the book at various points. Um, things like describing just making proper toast and having toast and marmite. I mean, we have got out of that way of enjoying those very simple things, haven't we? And you have a lot of those dotted through the book, which I found very entertaining. Thank you. I, I, it was, yeah, it was sort of, <clears throat> it was a funny book to write really. And, and it, it, it I had no, you know, it's 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 one of those odd things. I kind of had the 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 idea of 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 trying to live more simply, of of kind of connecting more uh, with nature, with my with with my community, all those things, with my abilities or inabilities to make things or mend things or whatever it was. Um, but as a book, I sort of I really struggled actually with how how it was going to work what was what was the narrative what was the you know was it actually going to be a book and um it, you know it's a it's quite an undertaking sitting down and thinking gosh I've got I've, I've had this idea you know my lovely publisher said yeah great go ahead and do it and then you can think gosh I've got to find 80,000 words about <laughs> idea and somehow they've got to you know they've got to fit together and it was it was it was a strange one really because I uh, you know, I went and met uh, all these people. I did lots of interviews. Um, I and and I started collating what I think of as kind of bits of a jigsaw. So, in fact, I have my trusty notebook here. Um, this notebook, uh, which is, as you can see, these are bits of the book. So I, I I wrote quite a lot of it longhand. And at the back of the notebook is uh, is a list of all the kind of chunks that I had. And I had this idea of, of wanting to somehow encapsulate things that made me happy, whether it was, you know, a really good piece of toast and marmite or collecting eggs in the morning. And, a, you know, a poached egg after going running with my dog is, is, you know, a poached egg is always a good thing. But a poached egg when you've been for a run is amazing. Um, blackberrying. I, I love it. Blackberrying is fantastic, isn't it? And I, like I, love, I love that. And we've been, you know, the blackberries around here have been amazing. So I've been out, you know, we had some friends staying at the weekends and I went to have blackberrying before they arrived so that they could have blackberry and apples from the garden and um and and so somehow I wanted to kind of dot those in but they didn't quite fit a narrative so I then came up with this idea of just having almost like little sort of interstitials you know like you would in a musical or something you have your kind of your main content and then you have a bit of the band just sort of twiddling along while they change the scene <laughs> it was, I think Nina was, Simone yeah. features too doesn't she you're dancing to Nina Simone at one point as well which I could certainly relate to and that raises your spirits when you I mean dance in the kitchen it's yeah a pleasure and if yeah. you're feeling a bit down it's absolutely brilliant it's, it's just, as I say, it's, it, they're, they're all little things that, um, that sort of don't really cost anything at all, but, but kind of bring, a, bring an enormous amount of, of, of real, what I, like, what I like to think of as gut pleasure. Um, you know, it's sort of one of the things I think that a, a lot of us have got into is uh, thinking that you know, particularly when life feels a bit out of kilter, as we were talking about right at the beginning, and you think, oh, I'm not, I'm feeling a bit kind of, maybe I'll just 
buy a new jumper and that'll make me feel better and 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 often and particularly now you know you go online and do it so you don't even go to a shop you don't even have any interaction you just sort of scoot through and go oh well that look, one looks nice you know I'll press the button and, and it arrives and you put it on and it's either a disaster and then you've got the <laughs> kind of bright old faff of having to pack it up and send it back and queue in the post office with your mask on or, you know, it's lovely and you go, oh, that's lovely. And then it's sort of forgotten. You know, it's not a, it's not a lasting pleasure, but there is something wonderfully, um, it, you know, it has a ripple effect, I think, dancing in the kitchen or really enjoying a piece of toast or um, it, it, I'm trying to think, oh, well, the other one, which my, my, my lovely friend Polly uh, kind of alerted me to, which was the joy of working in bed. Oh, um, I love that one. At the end, that's with your bed socks on. That's so good. And yes, and I, I do it lots. I really enjoy it, actually. Yeah, I, you, you know, as, as, as I say in the book, you know, as I, I feel quite guilty. I've got to go to bed at two o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, it's great. That's how, oh, my goodness, it's amazing. And it is, you know, and you get lots done, but there is something about that. It is a sort of proper contented feeling of being all warm with your socks on. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> oh, I think it's extremely other, good. Someone said the other day, I was being interviewed by journalists and they said, so, you know, what does your husband feel like about you being a sex symbol? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? Me? Are you mad? You have no idea. I'm sitting there with socks on. I love the way you introduced it. You said, so now I'm going to talk about working in bed. And then there was not that kind of working. I'm far too old for that now. It's very good. It is really, it's that sort of a book. But in amongst it, it, you've been terribly clever because you also bring quite a lot of very hard hitting points. The fact that electronic waste, I didn't realise, was the fastest growing waste of all, you know. And there's all sorts of things about the terrible... Um, emissions from CO2. I mean, it's a book that's, it's terribly, uh, there's many, many aspects to it, which I think all the readers will find very intriguing. I'd like to ask you about greater earthships because that was an extraordinary journey. And then I want to ask you lots about the farm and the animals. Well, the, yes, the earthships. So, um, as I say, I'm not a handy person. You know, my I mean, even if I hang a picture up, you know, in a very basic way, no rule plugs or anything. If I just put a nail in a wall and hang a picture, it will be wonky, even though I think it's straight. My husband will come in and go, why is that picture hung wonky? You know, I'm just just really cat handed with all that kind of thing. And it's frustrating because I think you know, I'm a relatively able human being. I'm not an idiot, um, but it does seem to be that I am completely idiotic when it comes to using any sort of power tool or uh, tape measures. Tape measures absolutely floor me. I'm just, <laughs> I have no ability to be able to measure anything accurately. I don't know why. And um, so kind of wrapped up in all the things that my brain kind of wanted to explore and, and, and is continuing to explore, you know, my year hasn't finished. It's going to go on and on and on, I think. Um, but was this idea of A, being frustrated about not being handy. B, one day I want to build a house and um, and I want it to be as environmentally low impact as possible. And I was talking about this with my friend Paul and he told me about Earthships. He'd seen a documentary and I was like, what's an Earthship? And he's one of those people who does, he, he's quite into UFOs and things. So I was thinking, oh, crikey, we, you know, we're gonna go off on some mad thing here. Anyway, I sort of looked into Earthships and they are these extraordinary buildings, uh, the brainchild of, a, of a, a sort of rogue architect, and I don't think he'd mind me calling him that at all, I think he would call himself that, called Michael Reynolds. And um, he has created this community in, uh, in Taos, in New, or just outside a place called Taos in New Mexico. Um, and, the, and he builds these, these houses, these extraordinary houses, out of basically waste, principally tires and old plastic bottles and glass bottles and cans. And, um, and I was so intrigued by this. And as I was looking at the website, um, I found out that they had an intern program and that you could go and basically volunteer on the building sites and go and learn how to build one of these houses. And I thought, I'm going to just do it. I'm going to do it. Um, so slightly madly, and I can see people going, well, it's not very environmental getting on a plane and flying to New Mexico. And you have a very fair point, but I did it. Um, and, uh, and it was an extraordinary 
lesson. Um, I spent a month, New Mexico in December is very, very, very cold indeed. It was like minus 20. Um, and, uh, and we were building these extraordinary, and there was sort of 20 of us, I think, 20 volunteers. I was almost the oldest, not quite. And, and at one point, one of the younger um, interns called me a buff old bird, which literally every time I'm feeling a little bit blue, I will remember that and think, great, I'm a buff old bird, life is fine. Um, and, um, but it was the most wonderful experience, not least because I worked with a man called Phil, who's, who's, who's worked alongside Michael Reynolds for 30 odd years. He said, all I know how to do is build earthships. And he was one of these incredibly gently inspirational people who just ignored everything I said about being incapable and just made me do things. I, I ended up, I, I, I texted, Ludo, my husband said, I used a jigsaw today. I actually scribed out a, you know, I was doing things that, that no one in their right mind would let me do here. Um, and I was doing them there. And, and at one point, you know, we were building a, a house for this wonderful, lovely woman called Miriam, and she was helping build it as well. And at one point I stood back and looked and, and, and there were all these metal flashings around the, around the windows that I had made, you know, and, and the, the door frame that I had scribed. And, and I was thinking, gosh, I hope to goodness they don't leak or fall down because it will be my fault. But at the moment, <laughs> I'm just, and it was, it was just, it was a really great experience not least because again it proved that in amongst all the nonsense that's going on and and you know a lot of us are despairing about how america is is shaping up at the moment but even there that there are wonderful people and wonderful things um there is an awareness and there is a willingness and uh, and a great a uh, tidal way of, of movement to do good things um, and that's very heartening. It is and I couldn't help thinking when I finished reading it that we might see the Kate Humble DIY show any minute now too which would be great. Seems a missed opportunity because you could give people a lot of inspiration from having been useless with the tape measure to obviously having mastered it. So well I think not it was, quite. <laughs> it, was <laughs> very, <laughs> it was a very satisfying, by the way I can't measure anything either so I that enormously. Um, you, I'm very envious of you because you have, without doubt, one of my most favourite breeds of sheep, the uh, Badger Face Welsh Mountain. Oh, but I couldn't you. have those sheep myself because I live in Scotland, so I had to have a Scottish breed, obviously. Yes. So, did you choose them because of living in Wales? Because um, they're a Welsh breed, or were I, you just? I did. I mean, I I wanted I wanted a native breed, and um, what what we what we do at the farm, um, as you say, we teach rural skills. Um, um one of which is a, a sort of generic small holding course to introduce people to the idea of um just how hard it is and the fact they'll never have any money or a holiday um but and, and we wanted to uh encourage people to think about if they were going to go down the route of having livestock uh to go either native or rare breed because the wonderful thing about native breeds in particular um is that you know they're hardy uh they're very good at looking after themselves if they're sheep you know they usually lamb entirely without any interference from any of us in fact I I tried to help my badgers and they're like we're, we're fine we'll just cross our legs until you go away and then we'll just do it on our own because we'll be safer um uh and and you know those breeds because they're not as commercially viable by which I mean you know they don't grow as big or they don't grow as quickly um it, you know we'll only keep them if smallholders have them so it was very important to me to have a native breed and uh and that meant a Welsh sheep um but I have to confess, Polly, that the reason I went for the Badger Face Welsh Mountain is that they are unbelievably pretty and they look like oh, they Stunning. There are some in the Glen very close to here, actually, and some of the locals really don't like them because they like blackies and everything. Yeah. But I just nearly drive in the ditch every time I go past them. They're, they're just they're, gorgeous. They're, they're gorgeous. And I think if you're going to have a small, you know, a small number of sheep, there is absolutely nothing wrong with buying them, <laughs> buying them because they're pretty. <laughs> Exactly. But they also they're very clever, those. I mean, I've known some badger faces and it's a bit like my Shetlands. They are very clever. And I think they're slightly more primitive, aren't they? So they are. They are. And they and but the, the other reason that I went for them, I mean, there was a practical reason, despite their Frida Kahlo eyebrows, which I love, um, <laughs> is that 
you know, they're a really, they don't get too big. You know, if you're a beginner, um, if you haven't grown up handling sheep, they're, they're quite tricky things, you know, and you, you, you try and tip a texel on its back to sort its feet out or something and that's a weighty animal you know that might be 60 70 kilos if it's a ram more so whereas a badger will get to maybe 40 kilos or 45 kilos and that's much more manageable uh, for somebody who 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 doesn't have the skills and that's me Um, so size it was important the other thing is that if you are going to eat them if you're going to or eat their lambs or whatever which I know some people find difficult and that's a whole other subject matter. Um, For me, I wanted them to be able to get to the size within a year. Shetlands, you have to wait probably 18 months, Mm -hmm. don't you, or two years before before they get the size. Sorry. Yeah. Was the ones from um, the island of Fuller, or they were originally, but of course now living in Perthshire, they've got huge, you know, they're Um, not little tiny sheep because the grass here is so good. So um, you also have your lovely Welsh Collie as well. And I don't know much about Welsh Collies. Can you tell people a little bit about, about them? How closely related are they to the Border Collie? Well, they're not strictly called a Collie. They're actually called a Welsh Sheepdog. And um, they are, uh, they're also not recognised as a breed in the same way that a Border Collie is recognised as a breed. Um, so they're described as a land race. And they're a really, really interesting dog. And I came across them uh, when uh, it was, well, it was uh, about seven and a half years ago. Um, Tim, who is the farmer I kind of work in partnership with at um, at Humble by Nature at our farm, was looking to get a a young, uh, well, a puppy to bring on because his old sheepdog die was you know, getting a bit slower. And he said, we, I need to bring a puppy on. And I said, I've always wanted to work with a dog. And he said, oh, a friend of ours has got a a litter of puppies. Let's go and have a look at them. And um, instead of getting one puppy, which was going to be his and I would kind of learn with, obviously I walked away with one too. And um, these were Welsh sheepdogs. uh, And mine is called Teg. And um, they all look completely different. So Teg is quite rangy. She's this amazing copper color and white, Um, but she had puppies with uh, a a very handsome dog called Tango, who was black and white, short nosed, uh, looked completely different from her. And I made a documentary about them and about the history of these dogs because thanks to the Border Collie, it has to be said, Uh, the Welsh sheepdog almost died out and that was because in the late uh, 1800s sheepdog trials started happening and um, uh, these flashy black and white dogs from the north started coming into Wales and doing these trials and people were just entranced by them you know border collies we all know we've all watched one man and his dog they're amazing to watch and so of course like all new things people went well, I want one of those so people started bringing in border collies to Welsh farms often they breed with the Welsh sheepdog and so that kind of the Welsh sheepdog started to die out as a type and in the 80s uh, there were thought to be only a, a, a really a handful left so the Welsh Sheepdog Society was started to to try and keep this fascinating land race alive. And what makes them distinct, because it's not look, as I say, or size or anything else, is the way they behave. So if you look at a collie, um, a border collie working with sheep, it uses its eyes, that fixed eye stare to intimidate the sheep. It, It goes very low and it stalks them. Whereas a Welsh dog, and all Welsh dogs will do this, and this is how you can tell whether that's what they are or not, they behave completely differently around sheep. I like to think of them as slightly over enthusiastic guide leaders. So they're sort of, they work upright, they'll bark, but not in the same way as a hunt away, but they'll they'll bark, they have their tail up, their head up, um, and they work the sheep in an arc around the sheep. So it's a completely different style of managing sheep. And for the mountains, my tag's just been doing all the gathering in the Brecon Beacons. So she's working on open hill all day, bringing in cattle, sheep, whatever that anyone needs doing these dogs will do it. So they're immense, they've got immense stamina and they've got, uh, they're hugely intelligent. They don't, border collies like instruction. If you tried to do a one man and his dog sheepdog trial with a Welsh dog, they wouldn't do it. They would just look at you like, don't tell me what to do. I'm gonna just do it my way. So it's very bonded to you. Is Teg very bonded to you? Is she a 
a one person dog? No, not at all. She and, and again, I think partly because they do work so independently. So I've been to a Welsh sheepdog trial. You don't. So, you know, the first thing to do is the outrun. The dog goes out and, and out and behind the sheep. A Welsh sheepdog trial, you can't even see where the sheep are. And you, you literally kind of say, away, your dog goes off, you go and have a cup of tea, and 20 minutes later, it comes back with the sheep, you've done nothing, you know. And um, I mean, she works, my my friends who are, are, are amazing shepherds and dog handlers called, to, called Simon and Emma, Teg's been working with them for the last two months because I've been away working. And um, so she will, as I say, she just knows what her job is. And um, she is an extraordinary dog. And if we walk, our neighbours have got... Um, bullocks he he has store cattle um and so lots of sort of slightly flighty bullocks and if we walk through the field with teg she knows she's not working but she knows she needs to keep those bullocks in check so that they don't rush us and the other dogs and she'll just stand there and look at them and these bullocks if they come a bit close she'll just go down and, she'll, and they're like oh okay <laughs> she's amazing but i won't tell her to do that she just does it now, on your farm, you are doing a fantastic job by the look of it, connecting people to farming and to the earth and to the rural environment. And you do beekeeping courses and you're a beekeeper, too, aren't you? I, mean, I am. I, I, um, I, I started about 10 years ago. Um, I have to confess now, we used to have bees in the garden here and, and I love it. I find bees absolutely fascinating, but it is a very time consuming business, actually looking after bees properly. And so now uh, what we do at the farm is work with an amazing charity called Bees for Development that just by chance happens to be based in Monmouth, in our local town. Um, and they run all our courses and, and, and help with the bees at the farm. And uh, their, their kind of remit, if you like, was they work in the developing world with um, indigenous beekeepers who are very good beekeepers but may not uh, have worked out how to properly monetize or make a business of their beekeeping so they support people uh, like that who you know to, to help them make a business out of their beekeeping and support their families but here they um, they do fantastic education in uh, sort of traditional beekeeping but also for people who might have an orchard or an allotment who don't want the kind of um, the quite high maintenance job of looking after bees, extracting honey, but having bees and supporting pollinators. So there are all sorts of different ways that you can support bees and keep bees without actually having to don a suit and, and, and you know, open hives all the time. Um, so they, it's been a really interesting lesson for me because I started out very much as a sort of learning the traditional beekeeping and now love the idea of, of actually just um, creating an environment and a safe place in a, in a funny sort of way a bit like putting bird boxes up so that you can support bees and they do all that wonderful work for you um but you don't take their honey from them which is lovely it just makes a lot of sense and bees are now being kept on roofs and things in cities aren't they which is incredible bee gardens on, on rooftops it is it is wonderful that um i mean you know it was it was out of a bad thing that the honeybee was in such serious decline and under such serious threat and it did become a bit of a cause celebre which was which was a good thing you know um suddenly everybody was keeping bees and uh and 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 you know people like martha carney have done amazing things uh to spread the word about how important bees are um and yes you know bees can exist uh, very successfully in an urban environment Obviously, you have to be careful about neighbours and all that kind of thing, which is why putting them on a roof works so well. And I've heard, I don't know whether this is true, but um, I think it's true that they keep bees uh, on the top of Fortnum and Masons in London, right in the middle of Piccadilly. And apparently the, uh, the honey's like 15 quid a jar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised it's that cheap coming from them because it's gone up quite a lot recently anyway, because it's getting yeah. so scarce. If you were to to give a piece of advice to people now with the situation about um, what we're facing, would you be telling people that the connection to the land is, and how would you get them to become interested? If you were talking to somebody who maybe had never had anything to do with the countryside, because you're so good at that, how would you start to, to tell them that it would be beneficial to them as well as sort of being out and walking and just yeah. being in touch with nature? 
it's very it's very very difficult if there is a word uh an, a word in the english language which i try and avoid as much as possible it should i hate the idea of people you know being being kind of coerced to do something you should do this and it was something i was very conscious of when writing the book was that this isn't a self help book it's not a book that gives you a kind of uh, a a, a to do list um it's my experience and some of them worked and some of them didn't and some of them i hope i will continue for the rest of my life and and some of them uh like washing all the bed sheets by hand um <laughs> might not um but, um, and 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 I suppose all I would say to people who, you know, there are there, there are some people who just don't like the countryside, don't want to go out into the countryside, don't find green spaces either intimidating or boring, and that's fine. But what I would say to anybody who thinks, and I have met people who are actually nervous. You know, they live in a city, they love the idea of going to the countryside, of going for a walk in the countryside, but they're nervous about doing it either on their own, or they're nervous about getting lost, or they're nervous about perhaps not, I don't know, not having the right shoes or something. There is something that holds them back because somehow they feel that it's not, they're not allowed to go there somehow because they're not country people. To which I would say, utter nonsense our countryside is for all of us and it is a place where if you come and you ask for help generally people will help you we're quite a friendly lot in the country we smell a bit and we're not very well groomed but um we you know if you ask for our help we will help when i moved here i'd never had a small holding before i had no idea what i was doing and and i was shameless i would just went up to anybody and just went i have no idea what i'm doing and they'd have a good laugh um but they would help and ultimately would be very kind and and there are wonderful groups out there to help people come out to the countryside and enjoy it and, and wonderful places. I'm going to big up the RSPB reserves, the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust reserves, which are just fantastic. And many, and, and, and the wildlife trusts, you know, there are a lot of beautiful wildlife places that are hugely accessible, either free or not very expensive to go to, and are stuffed full of the most amazing volunteers who will take you by the hand and say, come on, I'm gonna show you uh, where the kingfishers are nesting, or I'm gonna show you what a shoveler duck looks like, or you know what the trees look like in autumn, or let's go and look at you know the red deer rutting, or whatever it is. People love sharing things they love. So if you feel any sort of nervousness or any sort of barrier about going to the countryside, but secretly you would really like to just go to a place where you know that there's somebody who will just love to put their, ha their arm around your shoulder. I know we're not allowed to in these times, but sod it. Um, and say, you know, come with me and I'll show you, I'll help you get the most out of this. And, and I'm not going to say you should do it. But I'm going to say that if you do, I think it will give you more joy than clicking on any website and buying any pair of shoes or handbag or jumper. I would completely agree with you. And I really think that you do such a fantastic job connecting people in that way. I think you're such an inspiration and it's been an absolute delight to have you with us tonight. Wow. Now, I just want to remind people that Kate's fantastic new book, A Year of Living Simply, is available in all good bookshops, including our festival bookshop. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And thank you, Kate. It's been an absolute delight. And may I wish you all the very best with all your incredible projects. Thank you so much, Polly. And thank you, everybody. I wish I could be with you next year, perhaps. Hope so. Good night. Night-night.